Hey everyone, this is Steve from GamersNexus.net, and today we're reviewing Zotac's new Zbox EN760 mini gaming PC, I guess. So this, I almost said Steam Machine, and the reason for that is this was originally intended to be a Steam Machine, along with the Gigabyte Bricks, Bricks Pro, and Alienware's unit that have all started shipping recently. The reason these are not branded as Steam Machines, and they are instead branded as mini gaming PCs, is because Valve has pushed back their Steam Machine into 2015 while they finalized some controller designs. So what that means is that these companies have all these resources tied up in development. They don't want this hardware to go stale, to become obsolete. They've got to ship these things now and just brand them as mini gaming PCs. Then the end user, that's us, can very easily install SteamOS on there if you want to. You can DIY Steam Machine if you will. Let's run through the specs of this box before getting into the benchmark and thermal performance. I have already done a few short videos on this. This one, we look at the actual review of the product. So the Zbox EN760 is not even a mini ITX system. It's much, it's smaller than that. It's seven by seven by two inches, a very small box that you can actually mount via Visa mount to the back of a monitor or TV. You can keep it out of sight in that regard. And its target audience is gamers who would like a living room PC or uh, who would like a DVR replacement, that type of thing. Basically, it's an HTPC with some gaming prowess. Running through the specs, both units are identical other than two capacities, which I will talk about at the end of this list. The CPU is an Intel i5-4200U CPU. It is a dual-core CPU, and its native operating frequency is 1.6 GHz. It is turbo-boosted to 2.6 GHz, which is actually where it's going to be resting most of the time for gaming, and is pretty okay for most games, as we'll find out in a minute. The CPU is a mobile unit, and so is the GPU. The GPU is actually a GTX 860M with 2 gigabytes of dedicated GGDR5 one tw uh, memory on a 128-bit bus. And the reason I say dedicated is just to make sure you know it's not shared. It is not shared with the rest of the system. You supply the RAM. For networking, the unit ships with 802.11ac wireless. It uses an antenna for that that is included, so you don't need an external card. It has two Ethernet ports. It has Bluetooth 4.0, four USB 3.0 ports that feel somewhat limiting, as we'll talk about in a minute, one HDMI audio, one 3.5 millimeter audio, and a card reader that supports SD, SDHC, MMC, SDXC, and, uh, and all that good stuff. And then for video out, we have DVI-I and HDMI, so pretty standard suite of things there. The Plus model has two differences in that it includes RAM and it includes a hard drive. The included RAM is a single 8 gigabyte stick of DDR3 1600 MHz memory, and the included hard drive is a 1 terabyte 2.5 inch 5400 RPM drive. I strongly encourage you not to run on a 5400 RPM drive for two reasons. One, slow. Two, it'll be loud uh, in any type of HTPC environment where you want absolute silence so you can enjoy your entertainment. The DIY model, which does not include RAM or an HDD, is priced at $540. The Plus model, which includes those two things, is priced at $690. That difference, doing the math, is $150. For $150, you can buy your own RAM, your own SSD or hard drive, and it'll outperform the Plus model, and you'll pay the same. So if you buy this, if you're considering at all before we even review anything, don't even look at the Plus model, just look at the DIY model. Plus, it's more fun anyway, so why not, right? So those are the specs. Lots of talking in a very short period of time. <laughs> Moving into how this actually performs, because that's ultimately all that matters. Now we've got a small 7x7x2 enclosure, which means thermals are a concern. And then we've got an 860M, which means that gaming performance is potentially a concern. I tested this on four games. We're only going to run through two of them here, and then I will refer you to the article links in the description below so you can see the benchmarks and all the test methodology if you are interested in learning more about this and if it fits your needs, if it performs like you want it to. First, we're going to talk about Grid Autosport. I chose this because it's a new game. It's the type of game I could see someone playing in the living room with a controller or a racing wheel, and it's pretty well optimized, actually. So, Grid Autosport on the 860M with high settings in the benchmark performs at 65 FPS average with a 1% minimum low of 46 per, uh, FPS. That means you're 1% of the time dropping to just barely below 60 FPS. Not bad. This is actually very good performance. You could actually run this game on a hybrid of high and maximum settings, which is what we're looking at right now. On maximum settings, it runs at 35 FPS, pretty unplayable on the 860M. 
you can see that this outperforms the 250X and is just below the 7850, which is last generation's uh, mid-range budget type card. So not bad performance considering it is a mobile GPU. And it will play grid on high or high slash ultra settings. Pretty good performance there. Looking at Titanfall, Titanfall is relatively optimized considering what it is. And it, uh, it was pretty bad at launch, but it's okay now. Titanfall on the 860M on high and uh, on the highest settings possible operates at 50 FPS average. That's pretty good. You can drop your settings a little bit to, uh, to right around the high and medium high area and you'll get 60 FPS constantly which is perfect for a game like Titanfall that's what it's meant to be played at so again for about 700 bucks after you include the RAM and the hard drive you're running these games at a, at a playable 60 FPS at almost max settings in these two instances and that is noteworthy I know 700 is a lot of money you can build a very good big system for that but you have to keep in mind that the form factor is what you're paying for here 7x7x2 seven by seven by again is very tiny you can't build that in mini ITX because this does not include a power supply in it it's using an AC drop from the wall that saves a lot of space yes you can cheat sort of like that uh, in mini ITX but it's gonna cost you a bit more if you want something quality that's sort of where your where your money's going and it's not meant for desktop gaming anyway now I also tested Battlefield 4, Metro, and Watch Dogs, so I guess I lied. I tested five games. All of those are linked in the description below. Performance is a bit lower on those, obviously, because they are far more intensive. Uh, check that out if you want to play those games. Now in terms of things that I was concerned about, thermals definitely is, is the number one item. So testing thermals, I put the GPU at 100% load, and it operated at, doing the math in my head, 53-ish. Uh, Celsius, you'll see the chart on the screen here with the full number. It's about 53 Celsius after calculating for ambient underload, which is not bad. That's about what the dedicated GPUs I have perform at when under 100% load. So it's really, it's doing pretty well at cooling the unit. And that's because the only thing that's even a focus inside of this box when you take it apart is a giant freaking aluminum and copper heatsink with a fan on top of the CPU and the GPU. So it's obviously doing its job there. Idle was about 20 something uh, Celsius, and that's for the GPU. Looking at the CPU, idle was still in the 20s. It was about 23 Celsius, which is pretty warm. It's about 10 Celsius higher than what we're used to with a high-end air cooler on uh, on a bigger desktop. But again, this is small, so that's understandable. And then load operating under Prime 95s, LFFTs, 100% load, which you will never experience in gaming was in the, uh, again doing math my head, 45 Celsius range. Not too bad, it is a bit warm, it is a bit toasty, but what's really toasty is the SSD. I had a HyperX SSD in there, which should run pretty cool. It runs actually in the, uh, right around ambient at about 22 Celsius when in a normal environment. In this, it ran at 41 Celsius before calculating for ambient. Two times the temperature of what I'm used to, that's because it's sitting in between the GPU cooler and above the RAM and and an adiabatic wall on the other side. It, it will get pretty hot and it's getting two times hotter than what we're used to but you're still gonna perform okay as long as you're not really stressing out that drive too much. If you're doing really IO intensive tasks then uh, perhaps it is a concern. Thermals overall not bad. Actually I'm, I'm impressed at the GPU thermals to be quite honest. It performs far better than I expected and you'll have pretty decent longevity based on these thermals as long as things like the thermal pads, thermal paste don't uh, don't wear out over time which is something I can't really test adequately due to the time involvement there but everything looks good from the teardown I did so I do feel pretty confident in the thermals on this unit in terms of things I did not like uh, I did not like the SSD temperature I did not like the limited four USB 3 ports. You should probably get a hub if you're the type of person who uses a lot of storage, USB storage, uh, because those four ports will be instantly saturated by keyboard, mouse, controller, and one storage or network or other such device. So a hub is sort of necessary if you are like me in that regard, especially if you're trying to connect an external capture card for this so you can make a DIY DVR and get rid of Time Warner cable forever and burn them and uh, I'm getting off track here. <laughs> Hello, Time Warner Cable. Please don't shut off my internet. I need it to upload this video. So that's the Z-Box. 
Uh, overall, here's what I, th I think in terms of the target audience. If you're the type of person who, A, travels to conventions or travels for work a lot and can plug this into a hotel TV and do your work and editing there, talking about myself and anyone like me, this is a great product for you because it's going to be far more powerful than a similarly priced laptop. You're going to get more space if you connect it to the hotel TV, and it's small, so why not? If you're a gamer and you want a very discreet, low-profile HTPC that you can play games on in your living room or uh, hiding it somewhere behind your monitor if you've got a special project, it's great for that purpose. Do keep thermals in mind. Don't stuff it in a corner somewhere where it'll suffocate. If you are anyone who needs any amount of power, it might be worth investigating a DIY mini ITX system build instead, but do keep in mind that you instantly expand the size 3 to 4x because you've got to account for that power supply unless you build uh, with a motherboard that is capable of using an AC drop, and I'm not too familiar with many of those off the top of my head, uh, and they will inflate cost. That's sort of... The gray area, if you, it ultimately comes down to this. Do you want something really tiny? And if not, can you live with something that's about three to four times the size, but potentially more powerful at the same price? If you need something tiny, in those scenarios I described, this is your thing. Get the EN760 DIY model and throw in some RAM and uh, an HDD or an SSD. I make recommendations in the article linked below. I think it's good. I was fairly impressed with performance and thermals. It'll also make for a great Steam machine. If you would like to do a DIY Steam machine build, you basically throw SteamOS on a USB key and then install it from there and you're good to go. Uh, just keep those limitations in mind. And that is all for this review. I will see you all next time. Peace.